In this session, let's look at the residence time distribution in the context of the ideal reactors. And this might seem a little at odds with what we've been saying. So we've said that we would use residence time distribution to model the imperfectly mixed reactors. So the reactors that don't fit into any of the ideal types. So we recognized that there were severe limitations with modeling everything as a CSTR or a PFR or, or a batch reactor and we proposed that RTD would somehow be a solution to that. And yes, we haven't as yet fully unpacked how uh, we would be able to do that. Um, but um, what we're saying right now is we'd like to first develop the RTD for these ideal types, which seems to be at odds with this idea that we are going to use RTD for imperfect mixing. Well, we never said that RTD was only restricted to imperfect mixing. So the age distribution does exist even in the ideal reactor types. And let's draw some ideas about what that might mean. So if we think about our CSTR, for example, so just excuse the wavy hand here, but we've, we've got a CSTR. So as we know, it's perfectly mixed everywhere. So whatever enters is instantaneously mixed and of course, we have young particles appearing from the entry stream here. So remember, we had defined the age theta to be the time spent by our fluid elements in the reactor. So all fluid elements entering, uh, entering here are at age zero. But of course, it's instantaneously mixed in this reactor space. And of course, we are withdrawing fluid elements from here as well. And now if we think of the ages that can develop here, right, we may have that at the exit, there will be some fluid elements of age zero. In other words, fluid elements that have just entered, which also instantaneously leave. So it is possible for some fluid elements to leave immediately. And that's a consequence of perfect mixing, that it's uh, so vigorously mixed that um, we might immediately have some fluid elements leaving. But at the same time, this exit point is exposed to all the fluid elements in the reactor, including those fluid elements which have been here for, uh, for greater periods of time. So we can say that a consequence of perfect mixing is that all fluid elements are equally exposed to this exit point. And another way to think of this is in terms of death rate. So if you have a population that is exposed to uh, a certain death factor. And if we are saying that that population, no matter how old, so if we imagine some population distribution, so whatever it is, there's some age here and there's some frequency of ages. So if we are saying that all members of the population, no matter how old they are, are equally exposed to uh, this death rate, then that implies something about the age Carol, man, I'm trying to record here. Close my door and don't Look come in. Me. Yeah, very nice. Now close my door and don't come back in. Close my door and close it fully. So all fluid elements are equally exposed to the, ex uh, the exit point and they have an equal probability of reaching there. Of course, their probability may also be weighted by the number of such fluid elements. So a group from here where there are more fluid elements might have a lower probability than uh, fluid elements from here. So intrinsically, they may have the same chance of reaching the exit point. But in terms of the number of them that actually appear there, that might be weighted by how many there are of them as well. So anyway, um, in terms of the CSTR, we have perfect mixing going on here. And so there exists some age distribution in here, which we uh, would like to know. We would like to know what does perfect mixing translate to? What's the distribution of age in that CSTR? And to understand that, we can start with the mass balance on that CSTR. And that's developed nicely in the notes here. So we'll come to come back to some of these comments, but we can think about performing the tracer experiment that we mentioned before. 
So we said that if we pulse some tracer in here, that means we instantaneously inject a tracer in at some time, which we'll call T naught. Right, so here I'm trying to show that uh, this is the concentration of tracer at the inlet point. So this is concentration of tracer at the inlet. So the concentration of tracer was zero, and then it spiked up to some value, and then it dropped to zero again. So we spike all our tracer in in one instant at the inlet point, and then we said we would then observe the concentration at the exit point. So after some uh, time, so after T naught, we would observe some concentration at this exit point here. So we would like to estimate what this might be. And you could say, well, go ahead and create a CSDR. I know it's impossible because of perfect mixing, but still you can try and approximate perfect mixing by getting a very good mixer and you can go and measure that. And yes, you, you can do that. However, let's be a little cleverer than that and say, well, if it's perfect mixing, if it's a CSTR, we already know how to write balances on a CSTR, right? We, we have a design equation, but uh, we can just go back to our concentrations. And remember, for the CSTR, the mass balance on concentration of some component I looks like this. So dc dt equals ci in minus ci. So the concentration of component I is the same at the exit point as it is in the reactor itself. So that's concentration. And then we have the rate of formation as well, so Ri. So we have available to us this material balance. And yes, we did write this balance for the purpose of, uh, of reaction. We were trying to estimate the reaction rate and, and things like that. However, that doesn't mean it's not true always. So we, we can say that uh, this is a valid mass balance on any component passing through the system. And so we can say even for tracer, which we know is not reacting here, even for tracer, this material balance is still valid. Now, in the case of tracer, of course, it's not reacting. So this is simply zero. Furthermore, after T zero, right? If we consider times greater than T zero, then we don't have tracer in at the entry point anymore. So that's also zero. So we can say this balance when written for the time t greater than t zero, t naught, um, looks like this. So we can say dci dt equals minus ci over tau. Okay, and this is a simple first order differential equation. And I'm going to drop the I because we are only interested in the concentration of tracer right now. Right, and once more, we are doing this because we said when we pulse tracer in and we measure the tracer here, we get C, um, C as a function of T, so the concentration of tracer as a function of time. And if we divide that by the integral under the concentration as a function of time, so if we integrate over all possible times, which would be t naught to, to infinity, then we would get e, e theta. And so I should have written here, instead of t, I can rewrite this as uh, t minus t naught, which is theta. So, um, so that's how we can get e of theta. So if we can find this function c of t, then we can find E of theta. And now we've written a material balance for the tracer across the CSTR, and it looks like this. And now we can integrate this equation and say C, and again, I'm going to drop the I, C as a function of T, if you simply integrate this equation, is nothing but C naught, C I naught I would normally write, X of minus t over tau. So that's c of t. That's now a known function. And I can easily evaluate the integral under this. So the integral from um, t naught to infinity is equal, um, so that's the integral of c naught x 
of minus t over tau so we are integrating in t so this integral is clearly equal to minus tau c naught x of minus theta over tau and that's between limits t naught to infinity so t naught to infinity right and of course instead of t naught right at uh, t equals t naught theta equals zero right at t naught we regard that as age zero as well so instead of saying t naught here i can say this is equivalent to theta equals zero because i've written in terms of theta here so if you evaluate these limits right you've got infinity so here you've got x of inf of minus infinity so x of minus infinity is zero so this whole thing is a zero minus and then at theta equals zero this is x of zero so x of zero is one so this becomes minus uh, tau c naught so this is minus minus tau c naught so this is tau c naught Right, and so if we go ahead and uh, look at e of theta, it's c, and let's write this in terms of theta. So we can say e of theta equals c using theta divided by the integral of c. And so c of theta here, you can see, is going to be c naught x of minus theta over tau and then we are dividing by the integral of c and we've said here the integral of c is tau c naught so this is over tau c naught so the c naughts can cancel and that leaves us with 1 over tau x of minus theta over tau so that's the age distribution at the exit point of a CSTR. And if you want to plot it, it's a simple exponential die-off. So it, ugh. so excuse the shaky hand here, but that's um, E as a function of theta. So it's simply an exponential die-out. And you can say, well, at theta equals zero, it's one over tau. So you can identify a little feature here. 1 over tau, and then it's an exponential die-off after that. Um, so that's E of theta. And if you think about it, um, the reason for the shape is that in your CSTR, you have everything exposed to the exit point. So no matter what age you are, um, you are exposed to the exit point. And as time goes on, um, you are constantly exposed with the same probability to the exit point. So you enter the reactor um, at age zero, and you haven't spent much time there, so you've had some exposure to the exit point, so you have a low probability. But as time goes on, you've been exposed, you've constantly been exposed to this exit point, and the probability that you will not exit will decrease as you spend more time in that reactor. Uh, another way to think of it is in a human population. The older you are, the less likely you are to be alive, right? So that's a feature of being exposed to more risk over time. So in any given second, there's a certain level of risk. And let's say uh, we all have the same level of risk um, in any given second, then the probability of us... Uh, passing on in that second is the same for everyone. However, as we get older, we've been exposed to that amount of risk for the amount of time. So the older we are, the more time we've had being exposed to that risk. So the probability that we will survive to a great age decreases with age, right? So that's why it's an exponential die-off. We've been exposed to more and more risk. So in the CSTR, because of perfect mixing, 
because we are constantly exposed here, because we are equally constantly exposed due to perfect mixing, we are constantly equally exposed to the exit point, then as time goes on, it becomes less and less likely that we will not have exited that, um, that stream. So that, if you like, is how we can uh, reason out the shape of this curve. So as you consider greater ages here, um, you'll, you'll find fewer of them because there's a lower chance that anything will have survived to a greater age here. Right, so an exponential die-off, that's what we uh, get in a CSTR. And now we can think about uh, the other side of it, right? We know that's half the story. So we know we've got uh, E of theta. We would also like to discover I of theta. So we know the age distribution if we look at the exit point here. And that's not generally the same as the age distribution as we have inside of the reactor. Well, except in the case of the CSTR. So in the CSTR, it's perfectly mixed everywhere. That means you have the same type of content here as you have in the exit stream. That's purely a function of perfect mixing. So we do expect that we will have the same age distribution in here as in here. And we'll see just now that's not always the case. In the PFR, for instance, it's, it's quite different. But anyway, for uh, the CSTR, let's, um, let's look up the relationship uh, that we have between E and I. And if you recall, I of theta equals 1 over tau 1 minus the integral naught to theta of E of theta. And if you go back and look at how we derived this expression in the first lecture, at no point did we use any uh, type of mixing. We didn't prescribe the nature of the mixing. So this relationship is nice and general. It will hold for any uh, type of reactor. So anyway, that's our relationship between I and E. And let's now use that to discover uh, I of theta for the CSTR specifically. So I of theta is equal to 1 over tau multiplied with 1 minus and then the integral naught to infinity, uh, sorry, not naught to infinity, this wasn't right what I wrote here. This was actually naught to theta. Naught to theta. So here, if we are interested specifically in age theta, then we have to integrate uh, to that theta. And then we integrate here over the variable. So we are integrating naught to theta for the CSTR. So we can specify here CSTR. And for, uh, for the CSTR, we've just uh, discovered that E of theta is, is this function. So 1 over tau x of minus theta over tau. So let's do this integration and noting here this is between naught and theta. Right, so this is, uh, sorry, that we already have the limits of integration in the, uh, in the actual expression there. So anyway, let's uh, let's write this one over tau, one over tau, and this is one minus, and the integral of this it's uh, we can see a minus tau emerging as a factor here, so it's going to be minus tau times this, so it's going to be plus one, so it's one plus x of minus theta over tau and this is evaluated between naught and theta. And if we evaluate this, this is 1 over tau 1 plus and then exp of theta, this is simply the same function so it's going to be exp of minus theta over tau minus, and then we evaluate this at 0, so x of 0 is a 1, so this is minus 1. 
And now look at this, um, your ones cancel one minus one here, leaving us just with x buff minus theta over tau and then times one over tau. So this is one over tau x of minus theta over tau. So that's i. And now look here, that's the same as we have for e of theta. So we've got exactly the same function. We've got the same age distribution for E and I of theta. So they are both exponential die-offs. And again, the same reasoning applies. We are equally exposed uh, intrinsically. There's an equal probability of appearing at the exit. Of course, uh, it, it differs due to the proportion. Um, and as we get to greater ages, we've had more time of exposure and so uh, we get this exponential die off for E. And then because of perfect mixing, um, E equals I. Um, and, and we observe that if instead of applying that logic, um, instead if we use the general relationships and the general mole balance, um, we still end up with that same uh, relationship. So now we have a precise way of determining the age distribution in the CSTR. And you see this is quite useful because we can always evaluate tau. So simply the volume divided by the volumetric flow rate. And you see tau is the only parameter of this equation. Once you specify tau, theta is the variable of the equation. So um, just by specifying tau, we fully specify the distributions in both E and I. And so we know everything there is to know about the age distribution in the CSTR like this. Okay, so that's the CSTR, and of course it's uh, expressed uh, more neatly here in the notes. So the same material balance is presented here. Uh, here I'm using volumes and flow rates before I uh, go on to space times. Um, and then you can see the same integration and, and so on happening here. So all this is, is just what we showed now. Okay, so that's uh, the age distribution in terms of the CSTR. Now let's think about, um, we are doing here, the plug flow reactor. So let's just think about that first. So in our plug flow case, in the plug flow case, we can say we've got some reactor here, which is flowing along like a plug. And there's our stream in and our stream out. And if we think of it, in the case of the plug flow, if we apply a pulse here, right, and again, uh, we apply the, uh, the pulse at some time T naught. And now that plug, that pulse is going to stay together, right? The, the nature of plug flow is that whenever something enters here, let's say we consider the, the plug entering here. So we've got tracer in this uh, uh, group of fluid elements. Then sometime later, that group of fluid elements will all have moved here, right? And there'll be none over there anymore. So all of that tracer will have moved there sometime later. Then sometime later still, it, it will all have moved here and there'll be no tracer out here. And then all will appear at the exit point and all will exit all together in one plug out here. So in the case of the plug flow reactor, it's quite different. Right? In the case of the CSTR, when the tracer entered here, it distributed itself across the whole reactor and it slowly trickled out bit by bit. Everything was exposed constantly and um, fine, we had a high concentration initially, but as time was, went on and more and more left, then it exponentially de decayed out of that reactor slowly. Now, in this case, it's quite the opposite to that. Here, everything enters boom uh, at, at one time, uh, same as the, in the CSTR, but in this case, everything stays together. It doesn't distribute itself across the whole space. So in this case, we don't have perfect mixing that's going to shove molecules all the way to the exit point uh, right at the outset. In this case, all the tracer molecules are going to stay together in that one plug, and the whole plug is chugging along at some velocity u, some finite velocity u. 
So in plug flow, nothing is flowing at infinite speeds uh, in contrast to the CSDR. So in plug, it's moving at some finite velocity. It will creep along here, and then it will all exit together again out there. So that's the nature of plug flow. So if you think about what that means, it's saying that there's uh, fine, there exists some time T0. We know everything uh, entered at T0, but if we are looking at the exit point, uh, we won't see anything at T0. There's some time it's going to take in that reactor, and then at that time, it's all going to exit here. So the same spike we put in, we will see some time later here. So the question is, what is that time? And of course, we have still available the volume, the volume and the volumetric flow rate. And we said that the space time was something like the average time spent by the system, uh, spent by the fluid in the system. So that's V over Q. So that's going to be the time taken by the fluid to reach the exit point. So in other words, this must be the time T0 plus tau. Another way to say this is that all of these fluid elements have spent time theta equals tau in the reactor. So um, you can also say here, um, this is for age theta equals tau. So we'll see the spike at T plus tau, and the spike we'll see will be of fluid elements that are tau time units old. They've spent tau time units in that reactor. So these spikes, how do we represent them? Well, from physics, we have this uh, very nice function, the so-called Dirac delta function. So Dirac defined this function for applications in physics that had severe discontinuities. So this function is defined in this way. Uh, this is a function which is zero for all values of x that are not equal to zero. And this function goes off to infinity when x equals zero. Right, so it sounds a bit backwards, but um, let's try and draw it. So we've got Dirac delta function. Dirac delta function. And let's say this is x. And let's say that's zero. So we are saying here that as long as we are not identically equal to zero, the value of the function is zero. So that means the function is zero all everywhere here. And okay, let's let's do a let's do a different color for that. So the function is identically zero here. And then only at the specific value of zero. Right, so I'm I'm putting a, an empty circle here, which means there's no point here. And then this this value is jumping off to infinity here. So it's a severe discontinuity, right? All these points exist on, the, uh, on this axis, so it's all zero, zero, zero. And then when you get exactly to zero, it jumps off to infinity. And then if you consider points immediately to the right, it's all zero, zero again. So this is a pure uh, Dirac delta function. It's not quite the same as what we drew here. Here we drew a spike. Right, which is an approximation to a discontinuity. So in, uh, in the pure discontinuity, we don't have points, um, we, we don't have continuous points here like this. Uh, we don't have points like that. Um, so a pure discontinuity is like this. Of course, in reality, we can't go in and apply a pure discontinuity like this. It takes us some time, if, we, if our tracer is, is some salt solution, and if we are injecting it, then it takes us some finite time. And, and if uh, we are quite quick, um, that time is small, so maybe it's 0 0.1 seconds, but it's not zero, right? Uh, no matter how fast we are, there's some finite time it takes us to inject our tracer, and, and so there's a, it, there is some uh, continuity in the real world. But in the pure theoretical world, it's possible for us to claim uh, a complete discontinuity like this. So anyway, uh, the reason we are doing this is because 
we are we are not talking so much about tracer anymore we are thinking about f any fluid element that enters so we are saying all fluid elements that enter will all have identically the same age of zero so you'll have a discontinuous uh, discontinuity at zero there and then after that uh, and and that's an empty point and then after that the function carries on so that's, uh, if you like, the age distribution at the inlet point. So if you were to draw this against age, you'll have a value here and an empty point and then values on zero here. So that's the age distribution at the inlet point. And then at the exit point, you will have um, after tau. So you will have an empty point here at tau. And your point is going off to infinity here. Right, so, uh, so what we can say then is for a PFR that the exit age distribution, PFR, so the exit age distribution is Dirac delta function. And of course, Dirac delta function by default is centered on zero. We don't want to center on zero, we want to center on um, on tau. So we'll say here, theta minus tau. And that is a correct representation of the age distribution from a PFR. So in a way, it's a very boring distribution, right? Although actually uh, the Dirac delta function is not boring at all. But um, you see here, uh, nothing happens until tau then everything shoots out at tau, and then after tau, there's nothing, nothing older than tau can pass through the system. Nothing can stay here for longer than tau, and nothing can leave here earlier than tau. So that's how precise uh, this PFR is. Okay, so that's the age distribution in a PFR. Now let's think about the internal RTD for this PFR. Right, and uh, maybe take a second, pause the video, try and think about, try and draw a sketch of what you think the age distribution will look like inside this PFR. Okay, so hopefully you've got some nice sketches of what you think uh, it's going to look like. Now, first off, in contrast to the exit point, right, at the, at the exit point you had uh, no fluid elements of age zero appearing here. You only had everything at age uh, tau appearing at the exit. In contrast, inside the CS, uh, inside the PFR, you do have age zero. You have fluid elements which are of age zero. You have fluid elements which are of age slightly uh, older than age zero. You have fluid elements of age uh, tau over two. You have all ages up to time tau. What's more, you have equal proportions of all those ages. So because everything moves at the same speed and it's occupying the same cross-sectional area, you have equal amounts of all these ages up to time uh, tau. So for the internal RTD for a PFR, you have equal amounts of all ages up to time tau and after that time tau, you no longer have anything in that reactor. So this is I of theta. Right, so once more, you've got an equal flow rate everywhere. Everything is moving at the same velocity u. And it's, uh, uh, this reactor keeps everything inside until um, it's at age tau, and then everything exits. So everything stays in equal proportions. So you have equal amounts of all ages, and that line should really be parallel to that, that line, okay? And then when we reach tau over here, then it all exits. Okay, so it looks like this, right? Tau equals uh, some constant, which we'll talk about now. So it's some constant for theta, less than or equal to tau and it's equal to zero for theta more than tau 
all right now let's think about what the area is under this right remember we could always take the integral from naught to infinity for i of theta and we said this was a distribution function so when you integrate it over a range you get a fraction and now if we are going and integrating over all possible ages this must certainly be equal to a 1 okay so if you integrate if you add up all fractions over all possible uh, variants that must be a 1 now if you look at this you can see there's a 0 after tau right i of theta is non-zero up to tau up to and including tau but it's uh, it's equal to zero after tau so when we are writing this balance um, instead of integrating over all ages instead of integrating off to infinity here we can see we are not adding any area after tau so we might as well go and integrate instead up to tau only so not to tau and we want i of theta. We've, we've said i of theta equals k. So this is equal to a k. And we are integrating in theta. Well, because it's k, right, there's no theta. So k is simply a constant. So this is going to work out to k theta, k times theta. And we are integrating between definite limits naught to tau. So it's going to be... Uh, k times tau minus k times zero. So this is k times tau, k times tau. And all this is equal to one. So looking at this simply, you've got k equals one over tau. Right, and so instead of k here, we can write 1 over tau. So that's our internal RTD. And you see it's quite different. Um, so let's just draw them side by side. So E of theta looks like this. So at tau, it's not some finite number 1 over tau. This is going off to infinity. That's actually the correct way to, to draw that. So it's zero everywhere except at tau where it's going off to infinity. And that's very different to the internal RTD. So in contrast to uh, the CSTR where E equals I, here um, E is not equal to I and we've got kind of strange functions here. Now let's think about what happens if we put the CSTR and the PFR in series? So let's say we start out with the CSTR first and we follow that by the PFR. So what's the RTD going to look like in this case? And again, maybe pause the video and try to figure out what that RTD is going to look like. And to do that, you might try a tracer experiment. So imagine pulsing here and imagine what happens to that pulse as it passes through the system. So pause the video and, and try to reason out what the RTD is going to look like there. Okay, so hopefully you've come up with something interesting there, but... Uh, if we apply a pulse here, then of course we are going to get an exponential decay out here. And then that entire exponential decay signal, you can think of it as a signal, a concentration signal, that whole exponential decay is going to be delayed here by tau. And let's distinguish here, let's call that tau p and let's call this tau s. So the space time of the stirred tank reactor and the space time of the plug flow reactor. So coming out here, everything is going to, we, we'll see nothing until time tau p has passed, right? 
So you see um, this, uh, and we didn't really say it here, but you can think of a plug flow reactor as a kind of delay of the signal. So no matter what's come in here, this plug flow reactor is going to cause everything to get delayed by uh, the space time here. So like in this case, you pulsed everything at time tau naught, but it only appeared. So the same thing came out, but it was delayed by time tau. So in a similar way here, this plug flow part is going to delay the whole signal by time tau p. So the the CSTR is different. The CSTR is, is, has infinite energy, so it's instantaneously sending um, tracer out. So you do have, even at time zero, you have some tracer appearing at the exit. But then all that just gets delayed by time tau p. So even the tracer that shut out immediately here, even that, that will appear here first, but then it will just get delayed by tau p. So that tracer that shut out first is here, and then uh, you get uh, later parts coming through. So this appears sometime later here, and then that gets delayed further by the same tau p, so that appears here, and so on. So you get the same exponential decay, but it's all delayed by time tau p. So that's why for the CSTR in series with the PFR, you write um, this is equal to zero for theta less than tau p and it's equal to one over tau s and you would normally write here exp of minus theta over tau of course we have to shift all our time units by tau p so we're going to write theta minus tau p over tau s and this is for theta more than or equal to tau p. Right, so that's how you can express the shifting of a whole exponential curve. You have to shift that whole curve. You have to shift its argument here. That, that's how you shift the, the curve to the right. And then you also have to specify what's happening before that. Because if you don't specify this part, then uh, you would cause this function to be extrapolated backwards. So if, if you apply zero, theta equals zero here, um, you don't get zero here, right? That's uh, exponential function is a, is a continuous function. So you have to specify that it's zero before tau p and uh, it's equal to the exponential function corrected by time uh, for, for theta more than tau p. Okay, so uh, through reasoning things out, uh, we can uh, predict what happens here. So now take a second and imagine the switched around situation. So what if we have a PFR followed by a CSTR? What's the age distribution going to look like then? So again, please pause the video, think about it a bit and sketch out some possible RTDs and uh, and see if you can uh, see if you can reason this one out okay let's think our way through this now so we have tracer and again as I said before uh, use uh, a thought experiment involving uh, a tracer so imagine pulsing in some tracer here and think about what happens here and then think about what happens after that so here, obviously, this whole signal is going to be delayed by time tau p. So sometime later in this, well, not sometime, it's uh, a time uh, tau p afterwards. So this is going to be uh, t naught plus tau p, t naught plus tau p. And then here we hit the CSTR. And so instantaneously at t naught plus tau p, it's going to kick out some tracer and then... Uh, and, and then some will be retained in here and then it will slowly decay the rest of that out. So here we will see at T naught plus tau p and if we change that to uh, a theta scale instead of a time scale then this is tau p. So at tau p, um, so we see nothing at the exit until tau p and that's now because 
uh, again, this, this PFR has delayed everything. So even the spike gets delayed by tau p. So we only get something appearing after tau p. And then the CSTR, on the other hand, likes to throw things out instantaneously. So the CSTR will give us something at, at tau p. And then it, we know it's going to exponentially decay everything. So you get an exponential decay here. And so you see, we get the same result in these two cases, right? In terms of the age distribution, we get the same signal. So E of theta is equal to zero for ages less than tau p. So zero less than tau p. And then you get the exponential decay, which has been shifted by a time period tau p uh, after that. So that's CSTR and PFR in series. And you see here, the age distribution doesn't change. It doesn't matter what order you have them in, the age distribution doesn't change. It doesn't mean the conversion is the same, right? If you recall what we did in the first section, we said the CSTR was a bad user of the space. And, and so if the curve was sloping down or up, then if you change the order around, you would change the conversion. So the age distribution doesn't have the same feature, right? Of course, uh, reaction is not happening here. It's just uh, hydrodynamics, but um, it's, it's not the same as uh, the conversion case. So that's just worth noting. In the case of age distribution, you don't see a difference, right? The fluid doesn't see a difference in terms of its hydrodynamic. The hydrodynamic result is the same. The, the fluid has been mixed in the same way. It just happens that uh, the order uh, at uh, the yeah the the order in which you've done the mixing is different, but the same type of mixing has been done. The same hydrodynamics have been applied to the fluid in in both these cases. Now you can also think about the laminar flow reactor. So here we do have some uh, drawings. So of course in laminar flow you have the no slip condition at the wall and you have the maximum distance away from the wall at the center, right? So the center is the furthest you can get away from the wall, right? It's the same as saying um, the deepest uh, you can go into the jungle is halfway, right? That's the deepest you can be in the jungle. So um, at the center, you are the furthest away from the friction causing part. So your maximum velocity is here. Um, and we also have precisely that the velocity as a function of radius uh, has this quadratic relationship. So there's the maximum velocity and uh, so at r equals zero at the center um, the velocity is the maximum velocity and then at the wall where small r equals big R then this is a one so one minus one is zero so at the wall the velocity is zero. So we've got this uh, this quadratic function that applies to uh, laminar flow. Um, and by the way, that, that's by no means me trying to prove anything here. You, you can't prove uh, that there are lots of functions that have those little features. Uh, I'm just saying this, uh, this function does at least fit what we expect uh, to see. So anyway, uh, you, you can go and look in your uh, fluid mechanics notes for the uh, exact derivation of this. So um, we have velocity as a function of radial position. And if you think of it, that does translate to ages. You will have different ages then across this tube. So you can see that the fluid is flowing the fastest through the center here and the slowest on the wall. So it's going to take an infinite time for fluid that's flowing next to the wall because there's no flow there. So you've got fluid that's going to spend an infinite period of time uh, next to the wall and you've got fluid flowing near the center. Uh, so that's going to be the fastest out. So you, uh, if you are measuring your RTD at the exit, you will first see contributions at the exit point from the center line and uh, you will have some fluid that just never exits. So we would like to know what's the RTD in this case. It seems like you've got multiple ages coming through this type of a system. 
And to discover that, uh, we, uh, we, we can see here that the time uh, that it takes to exit does depend on the radial position. So your radial position dictates how long it's going to take to exit, right? This will never exit, this will exit the fastest. So we can say that the, the age spent in the reactor is a function of radial position. And in fact, we can easily estimate this. We can say um, the age spent by fluid elements at radial position R is equal to the length it takes uh, to traverse. So if this reactor is L units long, so it, it's L units long, and then at that radial position R, the velocity we know is U of R. So that distance that needs to be covered divided by the velocity at that radial position, that is, uh, is precisely the time taken to exit. So that's nothing but the age taken by fluid elements flowing at radial position R. And we can rewrite this, um, so our velocity u of r, we could simply uh, use our function u of r, which is known here. And we had said uh, it's u max 1 minus r of r squared. u max is also equal to twice the average velocity. And of course, the average velocity is nothing but the volumetric flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So this thing makes perfect sense to us. Um, so we'll pause the video and, and read this carefully if you need to, but uh, we've seen this several times in fluid mechanics. So here you can substitute for U of R. So um, you bring the, the Q down here and uh, you, your pi R squared is up there. You've got the L from, uh, from that side and, and then uh, you've got the 1 minus R of R squared over there. So that's how we can express theta of r. And if you look at this, um, pi r squared, that's cross-sectional area, and then uh, area times length, that's the volume. So this is v over q, and we know v over q, we like to write as tau, the space-time. So this is nothing but tau, and then the rest of the stuff we can just retain down here. Now, we, uh, yeah, on this, the assumption, of course, the laminar flow assumption, the assumption we are making here is laminar flow. So that means nothing is flowing radially. Everything is only flowing axially. So if you are starting at radial position R, you will stay at radial position R. So that's just the definition of uh, laminar flow. So um, moving on, um, what we will do next is differentiate theta with respect to R. So we can see theta of r is a function of r. Um, so if you differentiate that, um, you will get this. So just do that bit of differentiation and, and see that you agree that it's the same as this. And, uh, and this seems just random, right? We have no real reason to differentiate anything right now, but uh, let, let's do it anyway. We'll, we'll see something quite neat pops out when we do that. So, um, yeah, when you do this differentiation, you, uh, you'll be able to factorize it so that you get this term. And if you look at it, this term is the same as this here. So you can see a theta squared times this constant um, uh, times dr is d theta. So you can rewrite it like this. And then what we can do is, is, not, uh, is start going back to our fractions. So we can say if we are thinking about our CSTR, uh, sorry, our, our laminar flow, so we've got our pipeline that looks like this. Uh, yeah. So let's say the, the flow was in this direction. So if we pick some radial position R, then we can imagine a disk here and then we can imagine some thickness delta r. So we are looking between r and r plus delta r. So we are looking at this annulus. And of course, if you vary r from zero all the way to the wall, then that covers the whole body of fluid there. So there's a certain fraction of fluid between r and r plus delta r.
right? So between R and R plus delta R, there's a certain fraction of the fluid. So, for example, 20% of the fluid flows between 2 centimeters and 2.2 centimeters, right? So there exists some fraction there. And we can estimate that fraction simply by taking the volumetric flow rate through this annulus and dividing by the total volumetric flow rate. And you can see that happening here. So we take the linear velocity and multiply it with the, the circumference here. Or, or rather, let's, let's start here. Take the circumference and multiply it by delta r. So in other words, you take the circumference and you multiply it by delta r, then that's an estimate of this area. So this is the area, and then the linear velocity through this area is u. So it's like multiplying cross-sectional area by u, which is nothing but the volumetric flow rate. So that's the volumetric flow rate between r and delta r, and then that's the total volumetric flow rate. So this is the fraction of flow between r and r plus delta r. However, we have a relationship between r and theta. So if you go all the way back here, we have this nice relationship that tells us how age is varying with r. So you see, we can exploit this little volume balance here to find the fractions of fluid elements between certain age ranges. And that's all we are doing here. So it looks like a lot of algebra, um, but it's nothing but trying to estimate the fraction. So here is our age distribution. This is the fraction of fluid elements in a certain uh, radius range and hence a certain age range. And, and so that's our age distribution. So follow these steps and you'll see that uh, your exit age distribution is equal to zero before the minimum time. So remember, we said the maximum flow is through the center, so there's a certain uh, amount of time it does take to get through here, and we can estimate that. We, we, uh, it's, it's, not an infinite, uh, it's, it's not an infinitely fast flow through the center. So we have some u maximum here, u max. And we know for laminar flow, uh, u max is twice u average, and u average is um, q divided by AC, cross-sectional area, which itself is equal to pi r squared. So we can estimate u max. So that's the minimum time that's spent in the system. So we can say uh, theta min equals L over U max. And so uh, if, if you uh, look at the algebra here, you'll see that's equal to tau over two. So E equals zero uh, before tau over two, and then after tau over two, it's simply tau squared over theta cubed. So that's the age distribution for the laminar flow reactor. Okay, now in the session we used quite a lot of time on this laminar flow reactor, but um, actually uh, I, I really want the focus to be on the PFR and the CSTR. So uh, do be able to do this, but do go back and really think about the PFR and the CSTR and what all that means. So we covered that kind of compactly, but do go through and think about all the implications of these reactor types. If you fully understand these types, everything else falls into place. Okay, so that's just talking conceptually, just, just trying to understand what RTD looks like for the ideal types. And in the next sections, we'll look at uh, combining those ideal types or extending these types and uh, moving closer to understanding real reactor systems.